Yep. And so I sat there and I'm cooling off and jumped in the shower and took a quick shower and and you know, I, I started to feel better. But boy, a strange, strange feeling and a scary feeling that I went through. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, Good you got out of it. Well, you did. <clears throat> yeah, mm. yeah. I, you know, and I actually started the car and got the AC on, cranking that thing full blast, and mm-hmm. got home and got in a cool house, and it was just like anything. your show will go live in five seconds. Oh five Four, wow. three, three, two, one. Block Talk Radio. Block oh. Talk Radio. Well, that didn't. There we go. This, this is all, all about, about wine, wine. The talk show dedicated to the wine industry since 2009, featuring winemaker, cellar master, vineyardist, and tasting expert Ron. Basically, what we're trying to do on this program is just trying to educate people and trying to make wine less confusing and more friendly. From coast to coast and around the world. You know, we really have had some some neat people on the program. I, I just, I love that. Post your questions and comments during the live show on our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash allaboutwinebtr. Again, that's www.facebook.com forward slash allaboutwinebtr. And now, All About Wine is on. Here's Ron. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Okay. Oh, boy. I don't know why that came back they, on. They're all excited. Hmm. Hot Florida weather, so they are. We brought yep. them into the air conditioned tent tonight because it was just too hot out there. <laughs> Way too hot. And we way too hot and so we so we brought them into the air conditioned tent tonight so they're happy about that on top of the fact they always have good wine while they listen to the show so yeah, yeah good for them good deal we have a guest tonight Stephen Lane uh, he is an author and all sorts of stuff I mean the man has traveled around the world and you know I think the only thing he hasn't done has been up to the moon He's done just about everything else you can do on this earth. It's just unbelievable mm. how traveled and knowledgeable this man is. But um, he is an author, and he wrote a book. Oh, he's written two. He wrote one called Root Cause, and he also wrote uh, the most recent one is called Dragon Vine. And they had uh, the good fortune of uh, sending me the book uh a couple of three weeks ago and I finished it when was it today's Thursday I finished it uh, Tuesday uh, working my way through it very good book I uh, will discuss it tonight and and all that and oh I was going to ask Mike uh, mm. do you read novels uh, do, you, do you read books I do I didn't get into like the the thousand page ones um, but yeah I, I've uh as long as they pique my interest, okay, well, you know, I'll something do, like that. I'm, you know, if I am something interested, yeah. I'll definitely. get this to you then. Huh. Well, we better I'll, get. I'll get this over to you. We should get permission. I think it's not. You know. <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to go uh, with. It. Uh, well, um, it was. It, yeah, it we were, was a gift. <clears throat> I'm going to re-gift yeah. it. Okay. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, it, it's it's <laughs> a you know it's an easy read. It's it's fun. He talks well. Later. We'll wait until he gets on. He should be joining. I told him a couple, three minutes after the hour to join us because, yeah. you know, we, uh, yep. uh, we always introduce and open and all that. Mm-hmm. So, and it is three minutes past the hour, so I hope he will be joining us shortly. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a good book. He's, uh, in fact, let me go back to the original letter original email that I got I don't know if you mentioned from, uh, that he's also a wine scholar a uh, restaurateur and a hotelier 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 yeah. is it like a sommelier hotelier hotelier hotelier, yeah, hotelier. Hotel, hotelier? I don't asking, know is it like French uh, but anyway uh, uh, wine scholar that's a I big don't have to ask him. Yeah. that's a big thing um, yeah he, uh, well hmm. let me uh, yeah 
uh, it says here, uh, hope to see him, I'll find you a wine scholar and novelist, Stephen Lane. Mm -hmm. And then she wrote WSET, that, that uh, wine set, third level, FWS, IWS, SWS, CWS. So these are all the certifications he's got. Uh, yeah. And it says he's released his uh, new book. Uh, and his debut novel, Root Calls, was published in February 2019. And this is called Dragon Vine. And then she gives me a synopsis. And uh, let's see. Is this his second book? Because he did uh, Root Cause also. It, and I'm, yeah, which? this is his second book. Oh, the second. Okay. Right. And yeah, sure. and in the back of Dragon Vine here, he has a chapter. Uh, I think it's a whole chapter. <laughs> yeah, it says, uh, read the first chapter of Stephen Lane's next wine thriller, Jupiter's Blood. And so he's wow. got a, another one. Uh, that's either out or coming out or something called Jupiter's Blood. I haven't read it. I'm, I'm debating to read it because I got hooked on the other one, and I'm afraid that if I read this chapter, <laughs> then I will have to jump out and well, get the book. But uh, he might be on I, hold. Uh, he might be on hold right now uh, to come on the show. Check the uh, is he? check okay. the mixer. Let me see. Yeah, I, well, I hope that's in. There's somebody there. Yeah. So I hope that's him. So let's get him on the show and uh, be sure it is him. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There we go. I didn't click the first one. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to All About Wine. Good evening, Ron. This is Steve. How are uh, you? Well, doing quite well in yourself. Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. No, uh, it's our pleasure. I guarantee you. Uh <laughs> You uh, well, you got me, Ron. You also have Mike, who's my co-host on the show, and engineer and and tech man, and he just sort of sets off on the side and listens and tweets out about the show and stuff like that. But you know, we'll uh, he'll he'll pop in every once in a while like some <laughs> unknown ghost. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, good evening, Mike. Man That's good. Scene. Good evening. Yes. <laughs> yes, he is very much so. Um, but uh, we were just talking about your books and about and books, and that's with an S, and about Dragon Vine a little bit. And uh, by the way, thanks for the copy. I just finished it a couple couple of days ago. And oh, my pleasure. It really, really interesting. I in enjoyed it. I haven't read a complete novel in uh, a couple of years because I usually read short stories and short articles on wine and stuff, and that was. Very interesting, very fun. So, uh, first, we were talking about your credentials and all that you've done and everything. I I mentioned that you've been to just about everywhere except the moon. Uh, what the, if, <laughs> tell us about yourself? Where you where you grew up? Uh, how you got into wine and your travels and how you became? And then also, Mike and I were trying to discuss what. A, how you pronounce it? A hotelier, or a, how is it? Hotelier, uh, yes. Hotelier. hotelier. Okay. See, Mike, yes. you were right. It is French. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you will, it, I, I will turn the mic over to you and just let you tell us all about yourself and how you got to, uh, well, how you got to be an author and and all that stuff. Sure. Well, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I was you born in Africa. To. We got an so. hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I was born in Africa to a. Uh, a doctor, a physician, uh, my dad was a physician and my mom was a nurse, um, being Canadian and British. And I think probably developed my wanderlust ever since a young boy. So I went to uh, school in Canada, uh, studied history and psychology and got interested in writing and read a ton. I was an avid reader all my life and I really enjoyed writing and wrote my first novel after taking a psychology course. And when I, I had a big what if in my mind, what if this happened? And it became a novel and that's how I got into writing really. And just always been thrilled. Uh, just uh, yeah, delighted by the, the written word and learning more about the craft. So kept on writing throughout university and got into the hotel business. Um, having worked in a small hotel in Canada, 
that really caught my interest to be in an industry where you could travel and there's always meeting new people and having new experiences. And 25 years later, that, later I haven't stopped. I'm now calling from the wow. British West Indies. I'm in a small island called Anguilla, running a luxury wow. hotel. <laughs> yeah, so a bit of a long wow. distance phone call here. <laughs> yeah. And wow. It's just, yeah, it's just it's just been a trip. It's just been a trip. Uh, so I get a lot of my inspiration for my stories and my writing in my travels through the people I meet, the experiences I have, the anecdotes I hear from others. And I make it a point every year to visit at least one new wine region. So this year will be hopefully Argentina. I still haven't been to Argentina's vineyards. Big fan of Malbec and Torontes. Uh, so looking forward to that. But yeah, I'll try to make sure I travel every year to a different wine region. And in my travels, I guess, yeah, the last 25 years, I've been to nine, lived in nine countries, some wine producing, some not. And that's that's where all my story ideas come from. And again, those big what if questions, like root cause is all about what if phylloxera came back? And dragon vine is what about, uh, what if a ancient variety was discovered and planted anew in California? And Jupiter's blood is all about counterfeit wine and what if synthetic wine could be made uh, to be as, as authentic and quality driven as anything the best wine producers around the world can make. Mm-hmm. Well, I... <laughs> I was telling Mike before the show, you have a chapter of Jupiter's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jupiter's blood, is it? Yes, uh, Jupiter's blood, yes, which is okay. actually the translation, yeah. uh, that's the Latin translation for San Giovese. So San Giovese oh, is really? from Italy. Yes, that actually literally translates to Jupiter's blood. And I mean, oh. just in my studies, I find all these little fascinating tidbits and facts, and I just, I just love that. So I thought, what a great title for a novel as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's interesting. I never knew that. Yeah, um, yeah. But the Jupiter's Blood, you have a chapter of it in the back of Dragon Vine, and I just told Mike I don't want to read it because if I do, I'm going to get hooked on it, and I'm going to have to. <laughs> it, it, is the rest of the it is a teaser. Definitely. Yeah, I know. I know. It finishes on it finishes on a cliffhanger. So yeah, I would, I would yeah, have to apologize in advance. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I didn't read it. I was going to go. Okay, now should I? And I'm going no, nah, because if I do, I'm going to have to. I'll be hooked. I'll have to find out how it ends. Um, so you you also are. I well, I noticed all these initials uh, when Kelsey, your your publicist, I guess, got a hold of uh, me originally. She said, and he is, and she started to list all of these certifications you have, uh, yeah. you know, and, and wine certifications. When did you have time to do all this, and where did you get these certifications? Here in the states, or remotely, or what well, happened? COVID was a mixed blessing for a lot of us, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, oh, yes. I had planned, to, yeah, I had planned to travel throughout New Zealand and Australia, and so I quit my job in Singapore and planned to start traveling at the beginning of April 2020 with my father for a while and do these wine regions. And then COVID struck. By by the time that we realized how serious it was, it was too late to take my job back, and we were making cuts in the hotel industry anyways. And so I, the the plans fell apart. So I found myself back in Canada. Uh, without a job and lots of time on my hands. So I took the opportunity to uh, complete my French Wine Scholar with the Wine Scholar Guild. And then I did the Spanish Wine Scholar Program, the Italian Wine Scholar Program, and the Canadian Wine Scholar Program. I'm now currently doing the Certified scholar, uh, certified Specialist in Wine, the CSW. And I was able, in those two years, I was able to work at two different wineries as well. So not only having the knowledge of visiting vineyards and selling wines and buying wines for hotels, I've actually worked at two wineries. I worked in uh, Mission Hill, Canada's best vineyard and winery for several years in British Columbia. I was a cellarman, so driving a forklift most of the time and loading and unloading grapes uh, off of uh, trucks and into the hopper. And uh, the following year, last year, 2021, I worked at Trius Winery in Niagara-on-the-Lake. So a beautiful little ah. winery fo- focusing on Sauvignon Blanc. And there I worked in a barrel room, so primarily working with the barrel, barrel, the barrel room, uh, pumping wine into barrels, pumping wine out of barrels, and it was just a fascinating experience to see how wine is made firsthand. Lots of firsthand experience with the winemakers, a few days in the field itself. I wasn't picking a lot of grapes, but I did that for a couple of days. And, man, I have a lot of respect for those people. <laughs> That's breaking work. <laughs> oh, that I is tough, you tough work. <laughs> I, I have, I have horrid memories of the times where I was picking grapes. I, I'm not at all uh, – <laughs> sad that I'm no longer doing it. You know, <laughs> it is yeah, that, that's a tough, tough job. 
Yeah, I think once you once you work in a winery, you realize how underpriced wine really is for the amount of effort <laughs> and time and backbreaking work that goes into it. Wine should cost a fortune in every bottle, not just the uh, the DRCs. Yeah, I, you're right. It's, it's, it's amazing how much work and I mean and, uh, everything, the chemistries and all that other stuff you put into it. So um, I can go on about that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you. you so you recently acquired these these uh, wine certifications, then? You know, yes, just, just recently. Out, uh, I, yeah, I had already done the Wine and Spirit Education Trust uh, levels one, two, and three a, a good number of years ago, fifteen years ago, ten years ago. I've always been interested in wine since I got into the hotel industry, and I mean that's a funny story in itself. I was working at a five star hotel in London, working in banqueting, and. After six months on the job, my boss, the director of food and beverage, came up to me and said, okay, Steve, we're ready for you to do the wine list and update it. I looked at him. I had no idea. I had no idea my responsibility included doing the wine list. Uh, I pretty much drank anything that was on the second bottom shelf, uh, second bottom shelf on the floor uh, back then, (laughs) back in my early 20s. And all of a sudden, I was meeting all these wine suppliers and producers and being invited out to Burgundy, Bordeaux, Champagne, and Portugal and Spain to meet the winemakers and select wine for our wine list. We we sold about thirty million dollars worth of wine a year. It was a big banqueting hotel, wow. a couple of big busy restaurants. Yeah, it was a high volume, high volume uh, place. So the wine list was a really important and crucial document. So that's how I really got into it and how I how I discovered the, the love of wine. Wow, I mean, I, wow, that's uh, and you were you submerged into it with both feet. I mean, selling that much wine, you oh, probably got into it <laughs> so many different types of wines and, and different uh, varieties and stuff like that. That would that would be that would yeah, be fascinating. Just, but yeah, it's just an scary. incredible experience. Right? Yeah. Uh, very scary, yes, to have that much responsibility trust on to, to you at such a young age. But I uh, managed to uh, deal with it and figure things out. And I had a good team and really good wine suppliers. And that's where I really learned that People in this industry, the wine industry, the beverage industry as well, spirits uh, too, are just so passionate about what they do, whether it's the producers, yeah. the distributors, yeah. the retailers, everybody's so passionate, and it just makes for a wonderful industry to be in. Or the blog, talk, radio people, or anything with wine. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it yes, affects yes, all absolutely. of us. We, 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 you, know, you start talking about wine, and it just becomes a passion with anyone that's involved with it. Uh, you, uh, yeah. uh, Your first book that... Uh, you came out with, and I apologize. I'm, uh, I, I can't remember root cause. Okay. Um, yeah, my first wine thriller. You, what brought on the idea of that, and why did you uh, decide you wanted so, to write a thriller? You know, both both books that I've written in the wine industry, um, the inspiration came through talking with winemakers. I was at a uh-huh. wine tasting in London. I want to say back in 2005. And I met Joel Peterson from Ravenswood Winery. No wimpy wines, right? Uh, all those mm-hmm. in Vendel. We're, we're chatting. And he told me about this book called The Botanist and the Vintner. And this is a real-life account by Christy Campbell, uh, a, a book about the phylloxera epidemic, how it came to be, how it came to be uh, tackled, and how they resolved the phylloxera epidemic with uh, grafting of rootstock. And I read this book mm-hmm. in just complete fascination. And being an avid reader of thrillers and mysteries, my mind immediately went to, oh, okay, well, what, what would happen if it came back? And what would that look like? How could it come back? Why would somebody want to bring it back? And what kind of person would pursue the, the truth and try to stop it? And that's how the story came about for Root Cause. Over a number of years, ah. it percolated in my mind. So, but yeah, I, I give full credit to Joel Peterson for that, of uh, um, Ravenswood Winery, and I had the pleasure to meet him, and again at his winery a couple of years ago when I was visiting Napa and Sonoma, and doing a real deep tasting of a uh, of his library, and it's just a just a tremendous experience. I mean, just a beautiful place out there in Lodi, California. Uh, it is, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, I've been to the winery in Ravenswood, and it, it is a gorgeous place up there. Um, yeah. So so Rook Hall came out, and that gave you the bug to, uh, no pun intended, to write a uh, another novel. Yeah, so after Root Cause, the, the impetus for, I was working, I guess I was working in Hong Kong at the time, working in a, in a hotel company in Hong Kong, and started to learn about uh, Chinese wines and Asian wines and history, and just thought, what would be, what would, wouldn't it be neat to write a story about wines that ties back to history and have one of those novels that flips back and forth between two different eras, two different time periods, and have the stories tie together in the end, where, which, which they do in uh, Dragon Vine. 
so that's where the inspiration uh, there came from. So what would this uh, ancient grape variety look like? How would it transition to the future? And how, how could there be a connection to a wine grower, winemaker in California? And I, without giving away a whole bunch of the book, because we want all our listeners out there to jump out and be excited and buy <laughs> your books. So I don't want to tell the whole story, but there are certain things of it I, I want to talk about. Number one. There are certain themes, yes. Yes, <laughs> certain things that, you know, one of, obviously wine is, is the underlying theme on that. But this is a rather recent book, uh, I, I mean, as far as time frame goes, because it, you mentioned the fires the, the, and uh, Carmine's father was killed in the fire at the beginning of the book. And the, uh, you, you know, these fires are rather recent. I mean, it's not like they happened 15, 20 years ago. It's just, you know, within the last few years, we've had these intense fires. Excuse me. And uh, uh, so, and you've also mentioned things too in there that are uh, up to date. I, and so, uh, well, my question is, <coughs> excuse me again. My question is, how is this going to age in your book? I mean, you, you want this book around for a while. And do you, do you really think that these, so, yeah. these current things are going to become obscure and not carry any knowledge with them or do you do you think people reading it are going to say oh yeah i remember the fires of of the Napa and sonoma counties and stuff like that well if, if, they, if, they, if the story doesn't age um in terms of the times and i can see i captured the zeitgeist of the times and it's a snapshot of how things were uh, but I think with climate change and the impact it's having on the wine industry, on agriculture in general, uh, these things are only going to get more and more dire. And they pose a huge challenge to the industry. And there's got to be a lot of ways to adapt to that. And I, I tackle this, some of the same themes of climate change and Jupiter's blood as well. Uh -huh. But counterfeiting, counterfeiting, I don't think is going to go away. It's, it's always going to be a, no. an arms race, a genuine a winemakers versus counterfeiters. It's just going to be an arms race continually because there's so much money involved in the industry. I mean, they're, they're very, wherever you go now, you can find counterfeit products, whether it's Louis Vuitton handbags or Stella McCartney handbags or wine or even breakfast cereals. Anything that can be counterfeited can be. So it's just this arms race that I don't think that's going to go away. So I think in that sense, a lot of the story is going to be relevant. And at the, at the heart of the story, it's, it's about love and loss and family and what you'll do to protect that. And those are timeless themes. So I think it, it should age well. Very good. Okay. I just And then you quoted, uh, well, you, you mentioned a lot of one of the characters is from China. And she is uh, An avid China China mob. Sun Tzu, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. There you go. You, the, the Chinese terms and the Chinese words on there. I'm going. Where did he learn these? What is this? Is he making this stuff up? Because I don't know Chinese. You can just you know make up a word. Uh, <laughs> so what? Uh, do you know Chinese? Are these everything you wrote is actual true? Everything Chinese is and all? absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole story that revolves around the first emperor of China, the backstory, all of the, the backstory there is absolutely true. I mean, what the characters individually do in terms of the, the, the wine shop uh, owner and the, the uh, physician, they, they're, they're fictionalized, but all the major characters around them, the emperor, the emperor's advisors and sons, those are all real characters and all those incidents are real. The emperor did pass away. The emperor did uh, get poisoned by mercury over time by his advisors. So that's all absolutely true. Huh. So I, set the whole story against this true backdrop with my own fictional characters spread throughout. So I, I guess kind of a Forrest Gump approach in that, in that sense. So history is uh, real, but the, the main characters are fictional. Well, yeah, obviously you, you don't know that, you know, the physician was talking to the wine shop owner and this is what he said. I mean, this is, you yeah. know, it, uh, you know, would be a stretch, but, uh, but everything else is true. I, I, I yeah, absolutely. know so, that. All the terms, all the all the quotes, yeah, they're all absolutely true. And I mean, I studied history when I was in university, so I've always been a huge fan of history and a student of history, and just find it fascinating. So I'd love to tackle another couple of novels in the future where the same thing happens. Maybe there there'll be a winemaker in a time of uh, uh, Julius Caesar's Rome, and then that could somehow tie back to the future. Or I could just do a historical fiction wine thriller one day. So there's lots, there's so much, 
so many stories in the world of wine to tell. And I think I'm hoping this is a bit of a niche of the wine thriller. There's, there's plenty of great wine uh, books out there and wine mysteries and wine stories, whether it's Ellen Crosby, who writes her uh, murder mystery series. Uh, there, and there's a lot of other authors that write about wine, but I think I'm the only wine thriller writer. So I've got another two, uh, two novels being queued up right now. One's called The Psalm. Another one's called uh, Crush Crew. So there's a so in Jupiter's Blood coming out next, uh, hopefully later this year, if not early in 2020, uh, 2023. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're going yeah. you're gonna to be noted as a very prolific wine mystery writer. Uh, as I certainly passes. hope so, yeah. yeah. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, you mentioned a lot of times you know, during this, uh, you, you really dwelled into uh, the wine aspect of it, and you talked a lot. Well, I don't want to say technical. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't read it as technical because simply I know all this stuff, being in the wine industry and I don't know wine and all this other stuff. But I I just thinking, oh, this is cool. I know this, but I always, as I read those things, wondered how that would interpret to people who don't know that. Were you concerned about that? It's always a balance I, I try to strike in my writing because I know that not everybody will be as interested in as much of the uh, the wine uh, details as I might be. So it's trying to find a balance where you're not just info dumping and putting a ton of knowledge into a, into a page just for the sake of it, making it approachable, but also making it appealing to people who do know wine and love wine and can read it and say, hey, this is actually fascinating. I, yeah, as you say, I know that, I know that, I've been there, that's happened to me. So it's trying, it's trying to find that balance between people who love wine, making sure that it appeals to them and who know wine, and people who have never picked up a bottle that doesn't have a, a, a screw cap on it. So I was just trying to all appeal right. to all readers. Yeah, well, you did explain each thing on there, but I just I was wondering if, uh, well, okay, you, you answered my question. Because you were trying to let the people who don't know this stuff educate them a little bit with the terms thrown out there and stuff like that. So yeah, um, it's, it's not yeah, above, I mean, it, I'm just going to say it's not uh, above anyone who doesn't know wine and doesn't know stuff in the industry because you try to educate them as you're going through in the novel. And I've noticed that also, and that's uh, admirable uh, because someone can pick this book up and start reading it and, when they lay it down, be satisfied with the storyline and everything, but also say, well, now I've learned what a Corbin is and stuff like that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, they won't get yeah. a certification at the end, but hopefully they've learned enough to keep their interest, <laughs> explore more. And I, I've always loved reading books where I learn something, so it's not just a, a trashy novel where you don't actually learn anything, but there's actually some kind of industry you learn about and new facts and fun figures that you learn about. So that's always been appealing to me. And I, I try to write the books that I think I would like to read. And if I write a book that I would like to read, I think it would come across as a, a much more fun and interesting book uh, otherwise for my readers. Now, I have talked to authors before on the program, and most okay. of them have said that they don't just sit down and write a book and, okay, here's done. Uh, it <laughs> takes them time. They go back. They rewrite. They look at it uh, again. They have somebody else to read it, be it a, a, you know, a, a wife or a, you know, a significant other or something. And they say it's not – the final product is a conglomeration of months of changing everything. You too? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I wish I could just sit down, write the book, and be done with it. But writing the first draft is probably about 10% of the work. <laughs> There is oh, yeah. Rewrite. Yeah, there, sometimes you'll take out a whole character from a novel because they just don't appeal or they don't make sense. Or sometimes you'll add another character to the story. Um, I think, uh, yeah, originally Dragon Vine, when I showed it to a couple of beta readers, they, they said there wasn't enough female presence in it. So they're, they're, they, they felt it was too male dominated or uh, written more for a male audience. So I, I added uh, Vivian into the story. And that really changed the whole dynamic between the characters and the tone of the novel and, in a much more positive way, I think. And I'm really happy with that change. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of changes uh, made as one writes. I, I've got a good pocket of beta readers. I've got a couple of people who don't know anything about wine. I've got a couple of summer ladies who read it. I've got an, a great editor in the States, uh, New, in New York, who edits everything I read. I, I write and then one of my old English teachers as well 
he, he happily oh, really? reads everything I write too. Yeah, so it's great. Yeah, I mean, we're still still in contact and going back to yeah, okay. over 30 years now, and he still happily reads every page I write and gives me great comments and feedback. So, yeah, it, it takes a village to write a book, definitely. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, this is what, <laughs> and, and we've gotten that same type of. Uh, respond from other authors too. say that you know they in <laughs> fact uh, we yeah it, it, they make a whole novel and then they go ooh, and then they end up changing almost 90 percent of it because it's just not <laughs> what they were looking for so yeah it's I, I i've always had ideas to write but i'm just i'm not a writer and i accept that so i've never written but you know when and it's a shame because i've got a lot of a lot of ideas. So, well, yeah, that, you you must have a lot of anecdotes and stories, and I mean, fun facts and figures from your time as a winemaker yourself. And <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, and something else too. I mean, I've I've been involved with wine for many, many, many years, but I also worked yeah. as a photographer uh, oh, okay, for wow. a lot of years. I I worked as a photographer in all aspects, but I've done oh, I I would say conservatively thirty six hundred weddings in uh, in my wow. time as in my life as a photographer and my book would be anecdotes of weddings and what happens in different aspects of a wedding. I mean, there's some hilarious things and people are, that would be a fascinating you know, book. I would read it. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and that's what people say. And you know, I think brides would love it before they get married and them going, Oh my gosh, you know, these are what could go wrong. And, you know, and, but I'm not a writer. And so, therefore, I don't sit down and write. I, I have a hard enough time sitting down and and reading a uh, you know, sports page. So, <laughs> <I'm> writing. <laughs> yeah. You can but, get a uh, ghostwriter. You just sit down and tell the stories go. and read the book for you. Yeah. <laughs> just start telling them the stories, let them you know tick them out, and you know how that that might yeah. that might be worth it. But yeah, you know, I just I I envy you as a writer because that's something that I've never really never really been able to sit down and do. So. Dragonfly. It's a fascinating uh, process and very enjoyable. Yeah. Oh yeah, well yeah, and you have something tangible at the end there too. Well, same as making wine. You know, it's it's a fascinating process, and at the end I can say, here I made this and it's great, and people sip and go, wow, that is great. You know, and I think that would be the same with the book. Here I wrote this, it's great, and you read it, and yeah, it is great. And so the same type it, of it does feel good to have that tangible product at the end. Absolutely. Yes, and and. Uh, I, I think that has uh, a, a lot to a lot to do with your final goal is to have something there at the end, and then people enjoy it. Dragonfly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give away a whole lot of the story, but I do want to talk about the story itself. In fact, I sure. think I want you to talk about the story. Just give us, uh, you know, a synopsis of what happens on here and and the characters and. And what goes on again with, you know, I'm not asking to tell the story because we want people to say, oh, that's interesting. I need to go buy it. And so, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Carmine Cooper is the main character. And right off the bat, uh, his father dies in a wildfire. That's no surprise. It's in the summary on the back of the novel. And he's instantly put in his position where he reluctantly has to take over the family winery, which is an immense debt. Uh, there's, an, there's an ATF investigation uh, against the winery, the uh, ICE, the immigration authorities, are uh, constantly looking into the, the operation. He's a very vengeful and uh, challenging neighbor. So right away, he just has all these challenges, and he's looking after uh, his young uh, his younger sister. Their mom passed away some time ago. Uh, he's got a great uh, winemaker uh, colleague, uh, Solomon, who helps him out throughout the story, but he, he's just put in this impossible situation. He's trying to figure out a way around it, and he makes a couple of bad decisions, and that turns into even a uh, more uh more 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 challenges for him and eventually he's got to figure his way out of it so it's a it's a fun story a lot of different uh, a lot of different plot twists a lot of different uh, angles to resolve throughout the story and eventually it all comes out in the end and he, he's successful but he'll let everybody read the story to figure out how and why and yeah, so i think it's a fun and, story because it's all set against this real background of napa sonoma and uh, it was, I, everything I write about it, I've been to these places. So hopefully the readers can feel that when they're there. And you do a very good job of painting a picture of the different places too. You, you know, oh, thank you. They they end up in a barn, and you can mentally picture the barn. You describe you know the barn. This this is what it looks like, and you can see them in the yep. barn and stuff. So, um, uh, 
Oh, geez. I just, oh, and Carmine. Okay. His mother's Chinese and his father is an American. American. But you never really, and I always wondered throughout the, the novel, I was curious of why you didn't develop more on the fact that Carmine has to be, uh, a, I mean, he's not just a 23-year-old American boy. He is a 23-year-old Chinese-American uh, as far as descent goes. And so, therefore, his, his features and all this would be uh, uh, more oriental, I would think. And you never hit on that, and I wondered why. I, I do touch upon it, but very subtly. Um, the publishing world right now is very sensitive toward – People writing of others who are not of the same, whether it's, um, uh, I mean, of the same background. So for a, I mean, if you look at something like American Dirt, you have this American woman who wrote about, the American author, who wrote all about a, a Mexican struggle to cross the border and save her family. And that got a lot of heat. And so in this day and age, right. writing. You've got to be mindful of who you're writing about. So this wasn't necessarily a story about a Chinese American boy. It was a story about a winemaker who happened to have a Chinese mother, and I, that that was used to tie in the ancient uh, uh, emperor of China, of course. So that had to be right. some connection back to China. So I didn't want to harp on it too much because I'm not Chinese. I'm not trying to tell the story of a Chinese winemaker or the struggles of being Chinese in America, um, positive or negative. I, I wanted to look at it from the point of view of a winemaker who happened to be Chinese American, but there are there are some some subtle touches upon that. Whether it's uh, how he's uh, handled by his neighbor, how his neighbor approaches him, how the immigration authorities look at him and investigate him. So I do touch upon the fact that he is Chinese American without going to trying to tell his story, because again, that's not my story to tell. Uh, yeah, and, okay, that that explains, but uh, hmm, okay. I was wondering because being Chinese American, like I said, he would would uh, well, what's I, I don't want to say persecuted because he's not anymore, but it would be looked at differently, especially you know coming into a business that's Napa and all that was dominated by uh, white Americans, uh, if you will, and so yep. going into that, but. Uh, you know, that's almost a whole sub story there, I would think. And I, I see why publishers are shying away from it. So that that really is the reason more so than anything. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I even had some some uh, some agents and publishers publishers mention that when I approached them, uh, because they they saw that there was characters of uh, different nationalities, and they said, "Okay, how do you, what's your experience of those nationalities? Are you yourself American Chinese?" Like, nope. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, obviously, I, I can't write purely about uh, white Americans all the time, uh, white American males. So there do, there do there does have to be other characters in there, but their individual stories would not necessarily be mine to tell. Okay. Okay. But well, that I again, I was I was curious, and I, I something that I think it was an underlying theme there that since he was uh, Chinese American, that it would be brought up more. But I can see why now. So understandable. Thank you for explaining that to me, uh, Mike. Do you have any? You you have any questions? See see what I told you, Mike. Has been he, he, you know Stephen. She's experiencing all these it's places he's been yeah. and everything. Else. <laughs> Only thing he hasn't been is to the moon. And I expect that the yeah. grapes are he'd be up there next month. But, um, it's I just yeah. uh, just a comment. It's it's fascinating and and you've accomplished uh, an amazing uh, just everything. I mean, it's just um, it's just really great to you know. You, I don't know. It seems like a short amount of time, but as much as you've done in the industry itself, it's just uh, really. Where's our uh, audience? Oh, there you go. Uh, it's just. There you <laughs> go. It's just. Uh, oh, okay. Really. Uh, um, they were drinking. They didn't. They, yeah. Just the amazing well, I accomplishment hope everybody's you had. Having a glass of wine while they listen to this. That's mm. absolutely the right thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always have a glass of wine during the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, thank you. No, I, I agree. I mean, it's just you've accomplished so much. Uh, do you have a significant other in your life? Or are you traveling uh, life so far on your own? Uh, I, I travel to Anguilla on my own. So, no, I'm oh. still in the hotel industry. It's a bit of a challenging industry to, uh, to settle down and meet a partner sometimes. Um, but certainly that's in the future, I hope. So 
I'm not sure how long I'll be in a British West Indies. Uh, probably another, probably a couple of years, and we'll see what where I go next. I mean, the great thing about uh, having two passports and working in hospitality, uh, you can go pretty much anywhere. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Ideally, next would be a wine producing region, so I can travel to the vineyards more, as and hopefully uh, a place where I can study my for my WSET four the diploma. So I'm currently pursuing that. I've done a couple of the exams. I need to finish that up. Uh, in the next couple of years and then if that goes well and i have time i'd love to pursue the master of wine accreditation eventually so that's the, that's the yeah. ultimate goal and then continue writing books about wine and sharing my passion and and yeah putting all this uh well-found knowledge into use in a fun and educational way in these books yeah that, that sounds like a, a fascinating fascinating life it really is um i my wife i refer to as engineer during the show just brought me in uh, a wine, uh, King Stag, uh, California Merlot 2019, from oh, King nice. Stag, uh, King okay. Stag Cellars. Uh, yeah, it just it doesn't say anything much about it. It just has a little publicity thing about the grace, but uh, a uh, very pretty bottle, of Calif- a 2019 Merlot. And well, me, it's nice to see Merlot making a comeback now. I see it more and more on the shelves, and more and more producers are are bringing it back. Ever since Sideways came out, and it went the way I know. <laughs> I know. Never, never, never had a book had so much impact on a wine on a grape variety. So now, I mean, yeah. what, what, what a lot of notoriety uh, Rex Pickett got off of that is fantastic. So, so as an author, it, it, I know I've got a lot of responsibility. I can't, uh, I can't uh, uh, criticize any particular variety. Too much. Yeah, I'll have wine. Yeah, after after, <laughs> after sideways came out, I had a had a young lady who was in the winery, and uh, after tasting, and she motioned me over, and she goes, "I have a question." I go, "Yeah." She goes, "Is it all right to drink Merlot?" I go, "Yeah." Oh yeah, my god, that's more than all right. <laughs> it is a great one. I said, "Did you happen to see the movie Sideways?" She goes, "Yes, I did." I just you know, oh, it's, yeah. it's a movie. Drink pictures. Merlot. <laughs> you know? yeah, please, but please, it's a beautiful variety. Just, it just struck me when you know, and it struck me how much of an impact uh, that novel and movie had on Merlot. I mean. It was really Oh yeah, it, it decimated the Merlot industry, absolutely. And the challenge of course, as you know, with, with wine is it takes three to four years to pivot. You can't just produce Pinot Noir the next year. You've gotta I mean, dig up the dig up the vines, replant and it's unless you get the the bridles uh, done or, yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> And then you age them and all that, and you're looking at you know six, seven years before you have your. And by that time, Merlot was starting to recover. So, you know. yeah, but, uh, so you've got to pivot again. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, but uh, well, I never, yeah. I never realized until that young lady came up to me and asked me, asked me. I didn't realize how much of an impact, you know, oh, <laughs> that that had on Merlot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, to your point, but, to your point earlier, when you when you asked about my uh, my write my writing about uh, the com- current events like the wildfires, uh, I do keep up as much as I can in the industry. I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are in the industry, and I follow all of them on Instagram and on their websites and blogs. And I read the Decanter and uh, Wine Advocate as much as possible. And like I said, visit a different wine region every year to keep up to up to date and continue my studies too. That one has to. The wine industry is always changing, and every year a whole new volume of knowledge comes out. So you just have to oh. stay on top of it. Within that, though, there's so many great ideas for stories and characters and yeah, plot plot points. Oh, well, it, and you brought in two ancient Chinese uh, storylines in Dragon Vine. You said also uh, in uh, uh, Jupiter's Blood. You uh, said you're going to be doing that also. And is why do you go to ancient Chinese? Because it is ancient, the history there. Or you said you're going to look well, at maybe I- Roman. Yeah, well, I looked at. I worked in Hong Kong for a while, as mentioned, and uh, just fell in love with the culture there. In terms of, and then visited China and the site of the Terracotta Warriors. So that's where some of the, the story ideas came from. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm a history major too. So just the history fascinates uh-huh. me. And I was history definitely informs and influences the future. And finding fun and uh, interesting ways to tie um, these events from the from the past to the present is, is a challenge that any author would would undertake. So. Uh, I certainly could write mm-hmm. easier, more linear books. It might be a lot faster too, but I like to challenge myself <laughs> as a writer. <laughs> so, and I think hopefully it's richer, it's a, it results in a richer story for the reader. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's it, Dragon Vine is really a really quite fascinating book. I enjoyed it tremendously. Well, um, no, you're quite welcome, uh, and thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, the novel, I usually try if I get a chance to read something before I get a guest on, I'll usually read it. But Dragon Vine was one of those where uh, there were chapters in the middle of there where I literally could not put it down. It was, uh, well, what's going to happen to this person? What's going to happen to this person type thing? And that you did create a uh, a thriller there in the fact that you, well, what is the thriller but wanting to find out what is going on? And so that's just uh, just what you did with Dragon Vine, yeah. which makes me want to... Go ahead. Go on. I was, was going to say this. Yeah, there's certainly the intent there to to write thrillers and to have every chapter finish on a, a bit of a cliffhanger, uh, and then yeah, to invite the guests to read as much uh, more and to to continue reading. So it's a bit of a challenge to write that way, but I think yeah, I think a lot of fun. And as I mentioned, just a bit of a, a niche that I'm hoping to create with this wine industry thrillers, and eventually create a whole wine universe of different characters that might end up one day meeting in different novels. There you go. Yeah, that sounds interesting too. <laughs> well, you said you know each chapter ending in a in a cliffhanger, but you have some chapters here, especially toward the back of the book, that consist of ten paragraphs, and that's it. You condense on the chapter, jumping to different characters, and that's just a chapter within them too. So um, your chapters aren't real long, but the, the, you do cover characters in each chapter so it is easy to follow that way you're you're not going to to tell the readers out there you're not going to get lost trying to keep track of who's who here i mean yes there are different yeah, characters every, yeah every chapter comes from a different character point of view so it's pretty straightforward to follow the story but there are multiple characters who have point of view status so you get to see the story from different uh, people's uh, through the different people's eyes and, and I, i've and, been writing for two and a half decades now, so I've been studying this craft for a while and have a lot of great influences in terms of other writers and those short, punchy chapters. That's very much a James Patterson effect, I think. And he does, he does that very well, so I like to emulate what's, what works out there. And it's it's a good way to do it. I mean, you, you, there's enough characters there that makes the story interesting, but there's not so many that you got to go, well, let's see, who's this person? You have to refer back to uh, earlier chapters to try to figure out what, what this person is doing in the story. It's just there's enough there that you know who they are and everybody ties in together, but you're not overwhelmed by characters, which sometimes that could be distracting in a novel. And so I'll give you... It's uh, not Warren Peace, that's for sure. It's more Shard and Reese, so Chardonnay and Riesling. So yeah, much more approachable, <laughs> much easier to write. <laughs> There you go. There you go. It, yeah, it, it's a very good, very good book on that. Um, so you are Dragon Vine. If people want to purchase this book, I I see on the book uh, iUniverse dot com. That's probably uh, that's the one here, of the ways. Right? And you can go on any, yeah, you can go on any online bookseller, Amazon, Borders, Noble, uh, uh, yeah, Borders, and you can pick that. You can pick up uh, Dragon Vine and my previous novel, Root Cause. Yeah, and uh, and they're available we, on Kindle and all the electronic reading formats too. All right, it, you know you can check all of them out on that. And when are you projecting that you'll be out with Jupiter's Blood? Hopefully towards the end of the year, if not early next year. So just waiting on the publisher confirmation details. Mm-hmm. So we'll that's make a, a long of- industry. <laughs> yeah, I'll make a. A note to Kelsey, uh, who is your, I guess your, uh, your pub. Uh, your, my pub- yeah, my pub- yeah. in California. Kelsey okay, Bob. make make a note to Kelsey to contact us when Jupiter's Blood comes out, and we'll get you on. We'll talk about Jupiter's Blood. Oh, absolutely! And, and to do. That. Yeah, and uh, let people out there, you know, will we'll know a little bit more about uh, the next novel and all that, and maybe we can help create you an audience for your wine themed thrillers here. Yeah. And, uh, well, that would be deeply, us- deeply appreciated. And that's certainly what I'm trying to do as well. I'm sticking to this theme of wine thrillers now. And as they say in this day and age, uh, building my tribe. So 
So if I can get a good, <laughs> good, good, good following of people who love wine thrillers, who love wine, eventually that will just grow and grow and word of mouth will spread about the novels. And like I said, hopefully I'm entertaining and educating uh, people at the same time and it's something that people, they want to dive into. Well, it is very entertaining. I, I did, uh, did enjoy the book very much. Like I say, it was, uh, uh, I, I try to keep up on this one. I, had problems putting down on some of the end of some chapters because it was like, well, what's going to happen next? And you got to read ahead <laughs> a little bit. And so it, it was well, very that, good. That was that. Run. <laughs> yeah. Mike, any comments you want to make to Stephen here before, uh, uh wow. it's... before he goes from around the world? What time is it there, Stephen? Where are you at? <laughs> at the same time, we're on EST. Oh. So we're in the same time uh, zone as that makes it convenient. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, normally if I'm in Singapore and some other place around the world, there's a good 12 hours or 18 hour time difference. Here I'm in the same time zone, so very easy. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm I, I'm confused how that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm in the Caribbean, just off yeah. the off the, just off to the right of the Puerto Rico near Saint Martin. Okay. Oh, okay. So, not so, too, so not you're too far away. Okay. All right. Uh, well, yeah. I I was thinking. Halfway around the world for some reason. Well, that's <laughs> sure you know what that was. Quarter around, quarter, <laughs> quarter way around the world. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Our eighth uh, are divided into twenty-four sections for different times, so only not even one twenty-fourth. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, oh. Any any last comments? I was. Uh, here? I might have missed it already, but um, for some, I was trying to catch up on some of the notes here but uh, uh british west in wind west indies where you are now it, do they not have a wine industry i mean is is it not a not a thing there like it is you know elsewhere or, or what no it, it, the climate doesn't support it unfortunately ah, okay so there, there's a wine industry there so it's, it's a climatic thing unfortunately uh the soil the soil and the entire ecosystem here doesn't mm. support uh, that kind of agriculture unfortunately yeah but with climate change, one day, who knows? And that could be another subject of an awful one day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the way the climate is changing all over the world, it, you know, you could have... Uh, yeah, every uh, year we're planting further and further north, and uh, the, the southern countries are getting hit harder and harder by climate change, and it's changing, I mean, everything from capitalization to what types, what varieties of grapes are being grown. So, I mean, you know, climate was, change is having a massive impact on, on the wine world. And, again, Jupiter's oh. Blood explores that quite a bit in the next novel. Mm. And you know the the uh, new wine, our new grapes coming out all the time, trying to help mitigate this climate change effect on grapes. Yeah. And so they're coming up with new ones constantly. And uh, I, I, you know, that is something. I, when someone says, "Oh, Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or Riesling or Chardonnay," everybody's ears perk up because they're familiar with it. But when they start coming out with these new varieties, I don't know how easily people are going to grasp those and embrace those. I, uh, it's something that's always had me questioning if the new varieties are going to catch on, no matter how how good they might make them. It's just people are not subject to change easily. So, Yeah, the um, noble varieties have a stranglehold on the market that's for sure so yeah getting yeah. these uh, lesser known varieties out i mean and every country has tons of lesser known grape varieties uh mm -hmm. it will be a challenge a huge challenge for marketers and for distributors and wholesalers uh so but, but definitely that will be the way we need to go in the future because not the all varieties yeah. as well oh, as some yeah. of the uh, more hardy lesser varieties the only way they're going to survive in, in the heat and and the different effects not just the heat but you know the the uh, well look at france and they're being pummeled by hail storms it seems like almost every year now and and things yeah. like that yeah so. Bur burgundy gets hit every year by hail storms uh yeah in northern italy as well it only has its share yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. it's it's a different different growing world out there now so yeah well, and a huge challenge for winemakers that's for sure a big challenge it's uh such a, I am surprised that a lot of them haven't just thrown in the town and say, I'm not going to fight this anymore. So, yeah, and that's but, one of the big decisions uh, Carmine has to make. Does he throw in the towel or does he does he does he uh, focus on the future and take care of his family, save the winery? So he'll have to redraw. And there you go. 
very good segue there, I have to say. Okay. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> that's enough there. That's, that's why you're a writer. See? <laughs> All <Thanks> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for taking your time today to uh, oh, be on all about wine. It's really enjoyable. And for one last plug for everybody out there and all that, Dragon Vine by Stephen Lane, a wine thriller. That's his second one. Uh, he's got others that are also out there, so you, you don't have to just stay with one novel. Root Cause, it has uh, about phylloxera, you say? Uh, yes, uh, the resurgence of phylloxera. The research of phylloxera, and I've talked about phylloxera on the show many times, so my listeners should know about it. And then uh, the new novel, uh, Jupiter's Bud. So, and we'll look forward to getting you back on the show in about a year when Jupiter's Bud is out, and we can discuss that. So, well, I look forward to returning, Ron. Thank you so much for all your time this evening, and Mike, wonderful to meet th- you as well. And thank you. Thank you for everything. It's been a yes. yeah, great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Great talking with you. Me too. Nice to meet thank you. you so much for taking your time, and uh, we'll look forward to next year with uh, with your new yep. novel. Have a good evening. Okay, thank gentlemen. You. Thank you so much. Have a great night, and I'm, cheers. Enjoy that. Thank you. Oh, you too. I am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank good you. night. Good night. All right. All the best. Good night. You too. Good night. All right. Ah, there we go. My... There we go. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's a great novel, though. It, mm. it really is. And and we were we were talking. I don't want to. Uh, like I told him, I don't want to give away uh, anything uh, because it is a thriller, and you 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 know you got to read it and all that to see what's going on. It is four hundred pages, three hundred ninety-eight, I think. And uh, it's uh, it's an I I want to say an easy read. He's got it divided up into chapters, and the chapters have uh, unintentional sections in it. Simply because he separates when he talks about something some other place. He talks about the uh, he divides it up so you're not trying to figure out where you are and what he's talking about. He gives a little little split there to say, okay, now we're going to switch lanes and hmm. talk about this for a little bit but uh, very interesting novel uh fun novel and it will hold your fascination so get a chance uh i can dragon vine i had an opportunity to read it i have not read um root calls that sounds like that might be fun i've talked about phylloxera quite a few times on the show yeah. and uh you know the effects of it and how it works and all that and looks like he took that <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it looks like he took that and uh, wrote about another major outbreak of phylloxera, and that's what root cause is all about. So hmm. you can uh, check that out if you're interested. And then his new one, Duper's Blood, will be out in the year, and I'd like to get him back on the show, and we can talk about that one too. So hmm. good guest, a lot of fun, very interesting. And like you say, he's been everywhere. And, uh, Yep. Young and able to travel, and you know what a life, you know. Yeah. So, just put his mind and everything to it, and uh, this, the certification process. I, I can't imagine how much that has, you know, he's had to go through to get all that. But uh, very accomplished in oh, the industry, gosh, and yeah, uh, yeah it's, just, it's amazing. I mean, uh, those are not easy, you know, easy things to to uh, to have. So, uh, I mean, to earn, I guess. So, yeah, but. Uh, yeah. Earn, earn, great, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, hmm. I said hmm. FWS, IWS, SWS, CWS. That's what they are. Uh, mm-hmm. It's French wine certification, Italian, uh, Spanish, and Canadian. I didn't know Canadian had a wine certification, but the Canadian wine industry is really quite involved. So hmm. uh, it's been around for a long time. There's lots of wineries in Canada. Yeah. Uh, ton of them right by Niagara Falls and Niagara region there hmm. uh, so uh, you know it's, it's it's quite a quite an industry there so yeah so Definitely. interesting it um, uh, good guest good author and uh, we as always wish him the best and yeah. uh, 
glad he was able to take time and join us tonight. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'll have to I'll have to let Kelsey, that's his publicist Kelsey, and let her know. Keep us in mind on his next book. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Wine wine fraud. Yeah, that's what it's gonna go into. And that's something else we've talked about on the show too, is yes. wine fraud. Counterfeits and yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hmm. How to try to stop it, all that. Mm-hmm. The little underlying thing of wine fraud and dragon vine too. So hmm. uh, that's uh, he hits on that a little bit there too to to pique everyone's interest. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So well, uh, we're done done for another week. Now oh. we uh, are ending June and we're going into July. This next month, I need to find out when my cigar friends are going to be available on a Thursday night, but we are going to have a cigar show uh, sometime within the next couple of three weeks on All About Wine. We're just going to dedicate it to cigars because a lot of times people who drink wine are cigar smokers. And to prove my point, Wine Enthusiast Magazine has now, and a few years ago, came out with Cigar Fingiado, and that is the same publisher as Wine Spectator, so uh, they know that the market is there. Yeah, and uh, they know the market is there between the two, and so they, and so we are going to be cutting edge on this. We're going to do a show on cigars uh we have as of right now four guests four guys that do wine blogs and and uh are, i'm sorry do cigar blogs and they are very knowledgeable in it and all that and uh, so it's uh it should be a fun show and we'll set aside two hours for that show because these guys like to talk and uh <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> they uh, may may get on the show, and I just sort of sit back. Mike and I sit back and just uh, giggling in the background while they turn while it they over to them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yep. And I just hope they they write they write their. So let's hope that they don't get on the microphone and, and go. Uh, <laughs> <you Yeah. know? laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Now is this? Is this something that we may need to pre-record so I can cut out some of the language in there, or is it? Uh, <laughs> I've already warned them. Okay. I've already warned them. Yeah. Raise yeah, the I rating. I think uh, put it on YouTube. Yeah, uh, I, it might not be suitable for uh, children. <laughs> this is yeah, for, a late night show. Audience. Yes. Uh, yeah. Why, why yeah, are the I've kids up? At, them. Yeah, yeah. Seven o'clock. Put the kids to bed <laughs> at fact, seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Put the kids to bed. So. In fact, Cap, who has been a previous guest, mm-hmm. Cap says that means we can't cuss. And I go, well, you can say, you know, maybe sprinkling a dam or something, but mm. you know, yeah, stay away from certain words. Yeah. He goes, oh. <laughs> Did I ever tell you? I ever tell you the story about uh, the Shrek movie? I don't know if you've ever seen it, but. Uh, uh, when I I was I drove a charter bus. I don't know if people knew this, but many years ago I drove a charter bus, and we take kids groups, religious groups, kids, you know, uh, daycares, and they always wanted to watch Shrek. And we had this one group on there. It was like, oh, please play it, please play it. And the parents were like, all for it. Oh my God, that's a, you know, the cleanest movie that's out there and everything. And when we got off the bus, I said, do you realize what? Um, oh my God, what's the donkey's name? I for, maybe it's just donkey. I forgot. But when he's looking behind him and um the lion what's the, i forgot i forgot the characters but anyway when he's being chased uh marty yeah there you go when he's being chased and the is it the donkey the zebra i forgot what it was it's not a, anyway he looks behind him and he goes oh sugar honey iced tea and you know the kids laugh at it and everything <laughs> like that and i told one of the parents and i said do you realize what he's sounding out there and they go, no, what does, he said sugar, honey, iced tea. I don't see anything wrong with it. And I go, think about it. And a few steps think later, it was like, a few steps later, it was like, oh, we're never going to watch this movie again. And I can't believe they did that. And I was like, come <laughs> on. But uh, yeah, I thought that was, come I was on. like, there's a little, that was cute. That was little cute innuendos in there. But yeah, he looks behind him. He goes, oh, sugar, honey, iced tea. And we're like, yes. <laughs> 
kids, <laughs> kids just oh, no clue, no clue for the kids. But it was funny yeah, the that kids laugh, laugh. Yeah, you know? yeah. But and the, most the parents obviously didn't get it either. No, the parents didn't. No, they, she went and uh, told the the whole group of them, and they were like, "Oh, we're not going to watch that again." I didn't realize they said that. Oh, Come oh, on, it's not. They're not saying <laughs> they didn't it. Say anything. Yeah, your your five year old didn't even pick up on that. Come on, but. Um, yeah, and if you never... did, you need to look at more of the family issues. You do that yes. movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll never forget that because it was so so shocking that nobody had a clue. And I'm, I every time I hear it, and I look back and I look at the kids, and I'm like, yeah, they don't know. <laughs> they, yeah, that they, went they, right they past them. <laughs> yep, Could care less. Oh, that's but, funny. Uh, I never yeah. see. I'm gonna have to watch the movie just to see that one scene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he snaps out of it and starts chasing him around, and he looks back, and yeah, it was a good scene. Um, <laughs> but, uh, any iced tea. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes sense to whoever thought of that uh, yeah. name. It did a good job of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, that was that oh, was a that's time. Very good. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, now we're after eight o'clock, and uh, anyway, um, we have yeah. a. Yeah. Let have me a, give you a quick review on this wine sure. before we go. Uh, King's Stag. I'm That's not familiar with King's Stag, but the California Merlot. Mm -hmm. And it says on the back of the bottle, inspired by the noble creature's grace and natural elegance, King's Stag wines reflect the proud lineage and rich terror of California's most acclaimed wine growing regions. It says, this majestic Merlot envelops your senses with dark cherry and plum, setting a backdrop for mature tannins and moderate acidity. Its superb balance and refined character make this wine a noble presence, whether enjoyed with food or simply relished on its own. Well, that sounds like you want to drink it, doesn't it? Um <laughs> What is it? <laughs> what? <laughs> really? They paint a good picture there. Yeah. Uh, is, oh, there it is. Thirteen percent alcohol. And uh, California Merlot. Uh, it doesn't say anything else. Just California. Where is they located? Uh, Sonoma. Okay. They're located in Sonoma, which is actually the same county as Dragon Vine is located in the novel. So mm. that worked well. Uh, interesting. But it's uh, interesting color on this. It's a classic Merlot color. A little light, not real or dark, but uh, and I do pick up the plumminess of it. Cherries. And that's about it. Wow. But uh, a good plum. And the plum comes through in the taste. The cherry, not so much. So oh, there's the cherry in the aftertaste. It takes a minute for that cherry to come up in the aftertaste. Yeah, very pleasant wine. Uh, Nice legs on it for those of you who are into legs. It's got some some nice legs in it, on it, and it is uh, very very drinkable, very approachable. There you go. I can talk like a wine person. Wow. It's a very approachable one. Yeah. <laughs> I always wonder what that meant. Approachable. Hello, my name is Ron. Hi, I'm an approachable one. Hello. Um, <laughs> But, uh, catch uh, <laughs> catch Ron's new book, Approachable Wine, will be out uh, this uh, fall. So. <laughs> approachable, approachable wine. Approachable wine. <laughs> dun dun dun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I gotta add that to my. Going to run it higher. Can you approach it? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Oh. Oh. Mm. Okay. We uh, love that. So next month we are going to have mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have ourselves a cigar show, yeah. and we will keep you informed on that. And uh, also, I've got some emails coming in about other guests, so mm -hmm. uh, we'll start scheduling some guests this summer here for different things and continue our weekly frivolity and <laughs> our great guest and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is all the stuff that all about wine brings. 
there is a yeah. big weekend uh, ahead of us. Uh, July fourth is. Oh. Uh, Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Monday or Sunday? Anyway, no, Monday. Monday. Monday, yeah. yeah July Monday. 4th, Monday. Uh, so be safe if you're out traveling. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, be safe and, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, be careful out there. No, really? And, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. please be careful. Be careful yes. with fireworks. I mean, if you blow yeah. off a finger, it's going to be hard to hold yeah. a wine glass. So exactly. Don't do that. No. Mm-mm. Um, and then we'll be back uh, July 7th, and hopefully everybody will be back and join us. So uh, uh, have a great uh, weekend. Right. Be safe. Uh, have a great week ahead, and we'll see you all next Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, live on Blog Talk Radio, Facebook, YouTube, and who knows who else is carrying this uh, show. Carrying this now, yeah. yeah. Have a safe Good fourth time. and uh, drink responsibly, and mm-hmm. we'll see you next week. All right. This concludes tonight's broadcast of All About Wine with your host, Ron. For show information, links to All About Wine on Twitter and Facebook, or to be a guest on this show, visit the show website at www.allaboutwinebtr.com. Archived shows are available for download on iTunes or on our show page at blogtalkradio.com forward slash allaboutwine. Thank you for listening. Drink responsibly, and we'll see you next time on All About Wine.